Lucy, and I'm really happy to have Fiorella Isabella on here today. <laughs> Hello, Fi. How are you? Hi, I'm doing good. Thank you for having me on. I'm going to share your stream. Um, thanks for having, thanks for coming on. And I just want to say, like, Fiorella um, is awesome because honestly, like, before I had a YouTube show, I think I like emailed like one or two or three people, like different YouTube people um to to talk like about stuff going on in my area and Fiorella was like the only one that actually answered <laughs> so, um I just want to thank you for like you know paying attention to the pleads like <laughs> um, yeah. um so, yeah I think I think uh independent media needs to stop being like a repetition of corporate media where you know there's like this elite circle and I feel like people do that still sometimes. Um, and I think if you're going to say you're different, be different. So yeah, we need as many people as we can talking about all of these things. There's so much to talk about. So thank you for doing what you do. Um, cool. So um, today I wanted to talk very briefly and um, I just want to counsel about the fact that like, I'm not an expert on this topic, um, but there's, um, it seems to be a political shift right now in Colombia. Um, and I wanted to talk about it briefly. So um, this is what's going on right now. I'll just like briefly read the article um, or just the first paragraph. Um, it says, um, this spring, Colombia could elect its first progressive president. In primary elections earlier this month held for left wing centrist and ruling right blocs, former Bogota mayor and 2018 presidential candidate Gustavo Petro won an astounding 4.5 million votes. They don't say this, but that's basically means that like 80% um, of the people that could vote for him voted for him. Um, he won by 80%. Um, so um, the left-wing coalition is known as the historic pact. Um, election officials bowed to pressure from the right Monday afternoon and announced they intended to seek a recount. But Petro remains the man to beat when the first round of elections start in May. Um, so this was basically like a primary. Um, the country's right is riled by the real possibility of losing its long held grip on power. And so are Colombia's fossil fuel executives. Um, that's because of what Petro has pledged to do on day one, ban new fossil fuel exploration. Um, okay, so um, uh, what do you think about this, Fiorella, like just in general terms? <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is very interesting because Colombia for a long time has been kind of like the United States' ally in terms of the cartels, in terms of uh, foreign policy, they have become a very dangerous country. We've seen what's happened with um, the protest against the current government and how people have been murdered, disappeared, and just completely persecuted. And that has been largely ignored, of course, by the mainstream media and the Western media. And I think it's important to follow this race considering everything that's happened in Latin America recently with the elections of you know, semi-progressives uh, and some more radical uh, type of, of anti-imperialist like we've seen um, take pl uh, elections take place. We also have the election in Costa Rica that should be hitting the second round. We have the election of Brazil coming up in October between Lula and um, uh, Javier Bolsonaro, which is a very contentious election based on what happened before. So what we're seeing in Latin America is the uh, kind of shift towards a more of a multilateral type of world. And what I mean by that is there, that there is a more of an opportunity in Latin America because of their conditions to really like fight uh, for better economic needs rather than what we do as the left, most of the left does here is a lot of social issues more than anything. Um, so that's one of the things I see out of all of that. And I think Colombia has a chance. However, I think I'm a little less optimistic because there's just so much corruption that I think it's going to take a few cycles 
for the country to really come out of it. Yeah, um, I agree. I'm not so optimistic. Um, however, um, you know, it's it, it would be like a major shift because, um, you know, like the the it, Colombia is like the U.S.'s biggest ally, um, and they also um, you know, they train a lot of mercenaries there. Like the people that um, shot the Haitian president, it was like a bunch of Colombians. Like, <laughs> um, uh, so it would be interesting if they didn't have their finger. In, you know, like on the button in that country. Yeah. Um, um, let me show you. So Gustavo Petro just presented his um, vice president um, and it's live right now. So this is Gustavo Petro and this is the, the one that he's choosing as his vice. Aquí hay muchos liberales, hombres y mujeres presentes, acompañándonos, nos han acompañado en la campaña. Eh, su pregunta obviamente va dirigida hacia el Partido Liberal como tal, el cuerpo jurídico. Ellos tuvieron las reuniones ayer, unas consultas, sabemos que la mayoría quieren estar aquí. No vamos a dar nombres, porque eso no nos corresponde a nosotros. Lo que sí diría es que si se inicia un proceso de diálogo que a mí personalmente me gustaría, ese proceso de diálogo se centra alrededor de las reformas que necesita Colombia. Y obviamente, eh, pues habrá una discusión, un debate, no, no pensamos igual. Nosotros estamos... Eh, defendiendo la tesis que para tener una sociedad de derechos como establece la Constitución, primero y al lado hay que tener una economía productiva que los financie. Colombia tiene que transitar a una economía productiva fuerte en agricultura, fuerte en industria, fuerte en turismo que podemos, fuerte en investigación, ciencia y tecnología, que es lo que yo llamo la sociedad del conocimiento. Esa sociedad de, de, de derechos que se pueden garantizar así necesita estar. So he's like saying, like, I don't know what you think about this, but he's saying um, that um, he wants to ban fossil fuel exploration, um, but he doesn't want to do it right away um, because basically they recognize that first you need a diversified economy. Um, otherwise, like if you just ban something. Right. You know what I mean? Like you can't just do like a, you know, 100% transition from oil exploration to nothing. Like look at what happened in Venezuela. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, so I, I don't know, like, what do you think about this? About these promises to stop um, energy exploration? Um, I think that's, I mean, I think it's obviously in terms of the environment, I think it's obviously progressive um, to look at it that way, but he is really, careful in terms of the uh i guess how the how you implement it because as you said you can't just go from uh, fossil fuels to nothing and i think that's the problem that a lot of people have when they present these ideas of shifting away from fossil fuels is that they don't really have a plan to how to create a workforce you know in this a new technology how to get this expensive technology into the hands of everyday working people that, you know, need to get to work and need to, to find ways to really um, adapt. And I think that's the problem. I think that's the biggest hurdle. It's not that, you know, <laughs> people don't want to do it. It's more of like how, well, in this case, in Colombia's case, it's how do you, how you do that. In America's case, obviously, it's the <laughs> fossil fuel corporations owning the government. Um, but in this case, it's like, how do you build that without destroying your economy, right? So, yeah, it, it's interesting. I think from what I've seen, he's definitely the better candidate of the three. Um, I'm not entirely 100% sure about his foreign policy uh, per se, which is something I really look at uh, because I think that matters, a, if not the most, um, in terms of how that country will structure itself. But, yeah. I mean, it's definitely something that most people have not said, especially in that region. Yeah, and um, 
I just want to say, like, um, you know, Colombia is also like in some ways it's similar to Peru because they. Are you, uh, I can't hear you if you're there. I don't oh, know. can you hear me now? No. Are you muted? Um, no. Okay. This is weird. I don't know. Let me uh, let me come back. I'll be. I'll okay. be right back. <laughs> oh, well, there you are. I can hear you now. You can hear me. Okay, cool. Um, uh, it's similar to Peru in some ways in that, um, like, you know, there's American investment. Right. Um, and, um, I can kind of see why there's like people that might want to maintain that. And, and, um, there's a lot of like fear mongering about like, you know, even if it's like a liberal and not even like a left president there, you know, um, there's a lot of fear mongering about like, this is communism and like, (laughs) um, so, um, I don't know, but it seems like from the comments, I'm just going to mute it um, and show you the comments like on this stream. It seems like people are kind of excited about this. Um, so I, I don't know. Um, you know, like this person here is like, thank God. <laughs> um, you know, I, I don't know what it's like to live there, um, but it seems like he has a lot of support, like 80 percent, which is a lot. Um, yeah. Like yeah, that, is, that is a lot. It's indicative of people wanting a change, right? It's, in, it's indicative of people being fed up with the status quo, which is something that I think, like I said, people in Latin America can say because they're directly impacted by a lot of what's happening. They really have paramilitaries in the streets, like killing people. They really have so much dependency on the United States. They really have like the, the these problems that are directly impacting them and they can't really be too distracted. Whereas in the United States, we're extremely distracted. And that's something I've seen prevalent in, you know, other countries in Latin America, like, you know, um, Nicaragua, Honduras, uh, Peru, even like where people are suffering in poverty. And so they can't look the other way and pretend that it's not happening. It's like, you can't escape it. Um, Our working people here can still sort of escape it, even if the conditions are worsening and worsening. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, like, I don't like to pay too much attention to like the symbolism of having like a black president, because it's like, we've done it here and it didn't really like necessarily change anything. <laughs> you know? yeah. um, but like at the same time in Colombia, like I think this would literally be like the first um, female black vice president which like we have it here and it's like doesn't really mean anything it didn't really take us anywhere but at the same time it does mean something for them for like building their coalition because um the the air the pacific area which is like where more black people live um they're like you know frequently excluded from a lot of the political life in the capital city um so it kind of is significant that they're trying to build this coalition like this racial coalition um yeah and it's coming out of like an economic concern rather than just a symbolic, you know, eyeful identity politics like, oh, here is Kamala Harris, who doesn't know a thing about foreign policy as your VP. Uh, so, yeah, it, it's different. I think when we talk about leftism, when we talk about politics in the global south, particularly Latin America, I think it's entirely different what what it means to be a leftist in a lot of these countries versus what it means to be a leftist in the United States. A lot of these countries in Latin America are socially conservative. um, And that's something that a lot of people here wouldn't tolerate. So. Right. Um, So um, that's basically what's going on in Colombia. It'll be good to see like how this develops Um, uh, because this wasn't just about the election. They had like months of protests um and uh, all kinds of other stuff um and that led to this electoral thing so it's not just like electoral politics um so um anyway um i guess we'll just keep an eye on that (laughs) and see what happens because we don't really know if it's actually going to turn into any concrete wins um but um uh i wanted to to talk really quickly about um France um, slapping these sanctions on Russia and the EU ready to slap more sanctions on Russia. Um, 
So um, uh, according to like what you've been talking about and researching so far, um, what what path is the EU taking? Um, like, um, you know, do you want to talk like loosely about it or should I play the video? Um, so I can just give a brief overview. So the EU and France are slapping more sanctions on Russia, but they're also extremely dependent on Russia for gas. And that is going to directly affect not only the uh, currency, but also the, the, the people of these uh, countries, because Russia is now, uh, Vladimir Putin stated today that as soon as possible, they're going to demand the transition for the gas that they sell to the EU to be in rubles instead of their currency. And he has said that they have pretty much undermined their currency by breaking their obligations to Russia. So in, in terms of who has overextended their hand, it's the West that certainly has. And I don't think they realize it. Um, but even Macron recently stated that he is worried about the uh the just food shortages that could possibly happen so much so that he's willing to issue vouchers and, and and food food vouchers of that sort because of what's happening and how much money and the resulting you know like flack in, in terms of the gas and in terms of the sanctions because of of how, what how much help they're giving to ukraine and the Russian backlash. So they are aware that this is affecting like working people. But again, this is, this is, you know, they're fine, right? Like they're fine. And the weapons manufacturers are making a ton of money out of this. So um, what do you think the French reaction will be? Because like, if the price of gas goes up again in France, like French people aren't like Americans, they're not gonna like sit by as long, like they have the yellow vest, like they are, <laughs> really like a con yeah. you know like they fight for themselves <laughs> yeah they've been protesting against the mandates they've been protesting you know with the yellow vest against the neoliberalism of, of of macron um so i won't doubt that they're going to protest i mean we've seen protests already from truckers in italy and germany why because of these high fuel prices and they've hit a record recently and the uh united nations has said that we are closer and closer to gigantic food scarcity in general in the world particularly in those regions and it's it's i mean it's reminiscent of world war ii it's higher than at, the, at that point so or higher since that point so it's it's kind of like to me once it hits the pockets of these people which as you said the french are very easily you know when they protest they protest i think we're going to see a lot of pushback from the people in these regions as we're already seeing by some of them and uh, I don't think it's going to be a, a happy place for people like Macron and other U EU leaders. And I think the their whole like campaign to blame this on Russia isn't going to work when people see their leaders in front of them being the ones that are, you know, in charge. And we all know it's not just because of Russia that these fuel prices are increasing. This was going to happen anyway. Um, but they're trying to really, this exacerbates it, obviously, um, more so for the European Union, especially for Germany. But um, they, you know, they, they have overplayed their hand, so to speak. And Russia has other markets. So even though the ruble was affected, they're going to recuperate very quickly. And I think we can see that they're already starting to recuperate via, you know, having a relationship with China and India. Right. Um, I like for a second when you covered that on your show, the fact that there was a truckers protest for a second, I thought that the truckers protest here had turned into a protest about gas prices. And I was like momentarily excited. And then it was like, oh, Europe, obviously. <laughs> it's like not here. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, um, uh, let me, I guess, play this briefly, see if they say anything interesting. Um, uh, let me bring it back up again of Ukraine was the wake-up call for a stronger approach. On Monday, the European Union approved a new security strategy, establishing a 5,000-strong rapid reaction force to be deployed in times of crisis. I think that 
the adoption of this uh, document sends a strong signal of unity and resolve. It's not about creating a European army. European armies will remain each member state having its own military army. But we have to work together closer. EU ministers also approved a second round of 500 million euros of funding for aid and weapons to Ukraine. The 5,000 troop force to be operational by 2025 would have land, air and maritime components. So they just, I mean, it's same, similar to the US, they just approved an extra 500 million to like the European defense budget. Um, um, I Do you yeah. think that there's like energy in Europe, like by like seeing the connection between the defense budget and, you know, the social welfare system? Um, I, I think, I think that Europeans in general are going to see that uh, their system also sink. I don't think it's going to be as bad as the US petrodollar, but I think it's going to be pretty bad because it's kind of funny, like this shift, it's kind of karmic too, that is happening is, is really happening. And I don't think people understand how serious it is when India and Pakistan, countries that have been rivals for such a long time, are agreeing and saying, good for you that you are not following suit with the West and are doing your own sovereignty. Imran Khan, um, of Pakistan said that to India and they they're like mortal enemies. I mean, they won't even meet in person. So <laughs> that that is like a very big deal. And so when you see, you know, India doing business with Russia, rubles to rubies, it's the sort of thing where like, you don't need, we don't need the West anymore. We especially don't need the United States anymore. Look, look at what they're doing. Look, look at how this is happening. And I think the people in these European countries are going to see that even with their social, you know, social safety nets that they have, um, it won't necessarily be enough because of the inflation. And in, usually the United States is able to offset inflation by printing more money and, 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 you know, and just doing what they do. But I think that's just not going to be able to work anymore. And if the U.S. goes down, it's going to directly affect European markets as well. And just like, just like, Russia and and that region in Eurasia are very pivotal for wheat, for for gas and certain um, imports from or exports. They export, but Europeans import. Um, I think it's important to understand like these countries that have been sanctioned for so long are used to being self sufficient, are used to having to deal with these sanctions, but the countries that have been doing the sanctioning they're going to start seeing a lot of uh, just a lot of like all of that come back because they, they're, they're not used to doing that. And a lot of the people have never experienced what it's like to live like that with food shortages and stuff. And I think once you throw in the environment and you have war, famine, I mean, it's like a, it's like the freaking Bible is, is hitting like, like the, the, Ed, what is it? The, I don't know. I'm not religious, so I forget, but it's like, yeah the book of revelations that the book of revelations um yeah there's definitely gonna like our i'm uh, i'm worried about our currency but at the same time like understanding that it's kind of been a long time coming and that people yeah. around the world will probably benefit um from the dollar falling a little bit even though right now like there's like lots of countries where their currency is pegged to the dollar so, and they do still do a lot of transactions in dollars, so it will temporarily affect them too. Yes. Um, but yeah, there's definitely like a change in all of this. Um, Hi there says, all of your investment was pretty good. You nailed the dip on copper. So I was like telling everybody to buy copper right now if you can buy copper stocks because um, copper is conductive and it retains its value um, if your currency, if your, your local currency falls. Yeah, that or gold. <laughs> Um, yeah, or just straight up gold. Pricey. But gold is kind of expensive and copper yes. is a little bit. So, yes. um, yeah. Um, what do you think, like, um, uh, Primo Radical covered this in his stream. Um, what do you think about 
the disrespect with which um, they, uh, this woman um, treated the, the Chinese ambassador. Um, I haven't seen that. Um, okay, let me show you the, let me show you the clip. It's, it's just like really crazy. Ambassador to the United States, Jin Gong, was a guest on CBS's Face the Nation. During the interview, the host Margaret Brennan berated the Chinese ambassador, repeatedly asking him to condemn Russia. Before the ambassador could complete any of his sentences, Brennan repeatedly interrupted him. Take a look here at the uncomfortable, unprofessional interview. So if you, if are you is. saying, though, just so we're clear, are you saying Beijing will not provide financial support to Moscow to well, prolong this war? China has normal trade, economic, financial, energy cooperations with Russia. As I said just now. So it's not changing. You're not changing your built. relationship. These are the normal normal business between our two sovereign countries you based on international order uh, laws, including WTO rules. And let's you know, talk about those international laws, because four days ago, the International Court of Justice ordered Russia to stop its military actions. Mm -hmm. China abstained from that. The vote was 13 to two. Mm -hmm. The only country that stood next to Russia was China. Well, that sounds like you are condoning and not condemning. China makes its observation and conclusion based independently, based on the merits of the matter itself. On the one hand, the United Nations Secretary uphold, General said that uphold, Russia invaded. Yeah, we uphold. On the one hand, China upholds the uh, UN purposes and uh, uh, and the principles including that the respect for the national sovereignty and the territorial integrity of all countries, including Ukraine. Okay. On the other hand, mm -hmm. we do see uh, the, there's a complexity in the history of uh, the, the Ukraine issue. And we are in opinion. Would you be concerned Russia amassed more than 150,000 troops at China's border? Well, that's why we want well, just to, be clear, to have a good, China, you would, good you would, friendly, good neighborly relations with Russia. But you would recognize as a good, friendly, neighborly relations what, what with 150,000 troops on the border of a neighboring country and then to send those troops into that country. Yeah. In those circumstances, why can't you condemn this as an invasion? Mm -hmm. well, let's don't be naive. Condemnation. It sounds naive to say that's not doesn't, invasion. It doesn't a, solve the problem. You know, I, I, I the will be surprised if Russia will back down by contamination. What is well, urgently Will they back needed? down if your president is, asks Vladimir Putin to back down? Will your yeah. president ask Vladimir Putin to back we down? We have done so. They rely and we'll on continue you. to promote peace talks and you know, urge the, the immediate fire. And, uh, you know, condemnation, you know, only doesn't help. We need wisdom. We need wisdom. We need courage. And we need good diplomacy. Well, Vladimir, Vladimir Zelensky says he would like to meet with Vladimir Putin. Mm -hmm. Vladimir Zelensky is in a bunker. Mm -hmm. Vladimir Putin is at a political mm -hmm. pro-war rally right now. You can't have diplomacy when it is one country, the only one country willing to actually negotiate. China. Anyway, um, sorry. Um, so that goes on for for longer. She's like constantly interrupting him. Um, yeah. uh, so, I, I just. Go ahead. No, I just found that shocking. Like <laughs> everybody found it shocking. It was just like this woman was just talking over him. She she supposedly brings this like Chinese official on her show to talk about China's position. And then she just like tries to make him do something, make him condemn, condemn Russia, condemn Russia. I honestly, I, it's very, for me, it's just very reminiscent of what the U.S. is. It's because this person is is a paid propagandist. They're told to do this. They're told to ask these questions um, because in order for them to work 
in this way they have to they have to they have to produce like they're they're not going to approach this uh representative of china in a way that is going to show both uh you know a, a more diplomatic a more non-biased type of, of way their goal is to make the 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 chinese representative look like a um a partner of russia to vilify both of them because that's what this is about the u.s is waging a war with russia via proxy uh meaning via ukraine so it this is this is the west's proxy war obviously the united states and nato um are using the excuse of ukrainian democracy which ukraine hasn't had uh for a long time but especially since the 2014 Maidan coup where of course they allowed the removal or they they instigated with the help of of nato and the us the removal of a democratically elected leader so you could argue that that country hasn't been democratic since because they allowed another superpower up to come in and dictate who should be their president and of course that was victoria newland and we have proof of that via this audio that happened so that that, that it's just an excuse and so the questions she is asking aren't really questions they're statements and they are um gotchas to try to get the have this uh chinese representative be look like he is siding with russia um and in in certain ways they're not not siding with russia they're simply they're simply not going to issue condemnations or sanctions on something from the western perspective and it's very very like us like to come in and demand like bully people into try to uh to say something and and condemn somebody based on just because they ask and demand it and that's no longer going to happen because again china is another rising power and whether you can criticize china um for many things that doesn't mean that the there's not a manipulation coming from from the west to try to get uh, this you know double whammy on oh we don't like russia but we also don't like china and uh we've seen this kind of build up for a while now so it's it's no surprise it's happening china was never going to stand and condemn russia they like he said they're they're their closest ally they're their neighbor russia is never going to send 100,000 troops to china's border that's not going to happen and she's completely ignoring the fact that there were thousands of troops from nato that nato continued its eastward expansion that they violated that ukraine violated the minsk accords that uh th that there are, is a, a very serious neo-nazi problem in ukraine and obviously uh putin was asked to intervene a long time ago the criticisms were that putin should have intervened sooner and the reason he didn't intervene sooner it's becoming more and more clear it's because of china and they needed to know that china was gonna be there in terms of you know kind of not condemning what they were doing it, they they said for a long time and the cia knew that that was their red line the moment that they crossed this red line um then they would do something about it and a lot of people have been warning about this for a long time so he won't call it an invasion because it's not invasion it's you know it's a, a targeted military operation and it's turned into a proxy war because of the us and nato if anything and you know i i don't even align with putin like politically in any way really uh but i respect a any nation that's going to say enough to us hegemony and and this sort of monroe doctrine type of foreign policy where they still think that they have to be the police of the world that they still have to go around and and you know spread democracy but in this case it means arming funding neo-nazis because that's all that's left of the ukrainian military and that's they have the most influence in government they themselves say it they they're proud nazis they're proud um a, a minority of the country obviously all ukrainians are not nazis nobody's saying that but it's uh, a very influential minority in government and it's for so many of these democrats and these liberals and some of these quote unquote leftists who talk about trump supporters like they're nazis all the time they they are completely just dismissing a lot of the the historical context that is needed to understand why this is not seen as an invasion by russia and by china and by many of their 
allies in the global south yeah um the woman just reminded me she, like she, like she really needed her valium or something she and then she became infuriated lately like they wrote a follow-up article about how um the ambassador um like chin gang i think his name is um he was interviewed by margaret brennan and um uh, like they were she was infuriated because he suggested that um the u.s solved its foreign policy conflicts using a chinese idiom <laughs> like i don't know what the chinese idiom was but like i'd really like to know because apparently that's what like made them blow their lid <laughs> Um, which I find it's just like ridiculous, you know? Yeah. Um, does, um, so Fiorella only has like five minutes left here. Um, does anyone have any questions for her? Um, I think uh, Ashura had one somewhere. Um, ask her if it's because of U.S. relations that the U.S. let Saudi Arabia from beheading people for witchcraft and chopping up journalists with impunity. Um, I, I don't know if, if she's if if she's asking me to ask Margaret Brennan or ask you. <laughs> right. Because uh, the, the answer is the United States needed money. So yeah, I think I think it might be to Margaret Brennan. Um, but yeah, I, and, and speaking of Saudi Arabia, the United States is still continuing to sell weapons. Um, and everybody's ignoring the people dying in Afghanistan the this because of of what these this administration has done with the sanctions because of what they've done with literally not actually helping because we never actually help you know the United States government the intelligence apparatus and the military never help a country that actually needs help like in terms of help um because if there's not a profit motive then why would you do that? This is why Yemen is consistently left out of the equation, why Palestinians are consistently left out of the equation, why Syrians are vilified uh, in the way they're vilified, right? And you can see remnants of, of what we did in Syria with the chemical, alleged and debunked chemical attacks by the OPECW. Um, you can see that starting to play in with the denial of the bio labs or calling them biological research facilities and, you know, not admitting the full extent of what they were doing. And you can see that sort of uh, with Marco Rubio saying, oh, well, if there's a if there's some sort of biological attack then we know for 100 percent it's going to be the Russians, even though they have zero evidence to support those claims, but they're already throwing it out there. So in case that happens and that would, of course, allow more of a manufacturer of consent to form a more militarily targeted attack on Russia via directly by the U.S. and NATO. So it's it's um, this is nothing new uh, in terms of the foreign policy. But I think uh, what I really wanted to to really say is this is changing. We can see that China and and Russia have partnered in certain ways. Not necessarily because they agree politically as much as because it's an economic partnership, right? Um, you have the pipeline and you also have the fact that the United States is no longer the only player um, that's the number one player in this game. And so that shift is going to allow other people to come in. And then you have the Belt and Road Initiative. Now, the Belt and Road Initiative... Um, it's a good thing for some countries, but it's also going to be, um, you can also criticize China's role in Africa um, in other ways. And so that's left to be determined to see how much, you know, who plays into the global sort of agenda that we're going to towards with the, um, you know, the this sort of like social credit system that they're trying to get people into, this control of cryptocurrency, the, um, the just central bank going into digital, which is which is what's going to happen next, and how much other countries play ball, right? In terms of the the World Economic Forum, Xi Jinping has been a part of it. May that may or may not be reminiscent of everybody in government. So I think there's like a lot of things happening right now, and I think this war is like. Um, it's a distraction, but it's also something that they, they're not reacting well to. The West is overextended their hand, and I think it's going to get in the way 
of what they were trying to do in terms of more surveillance and more control of people, um, both in Europe and the United States. So it, it's crazy, crazy things that are happening. But I think Americans should really pay attention to the economic aspect of it, because um, as far as food shortages are coming, as far as, you know, environmental concerns, they're here with droughts and with with um, tornadoes and all of this stuff happening. And as far as uh, weapons manufacturers, they're still making a lot of money. It's not about what side they support. It's about the fact that they make a, a lot of money. Like they're mm -hmm. making money selling to, to European nations as, as well as, um, you know, sell, selling them to particularly Ukraine and just having this, this sort of um, usage, like the military industrial complex, Raytheon, Boeing, Lockheed Martin, they're making a ton of money. And what what do people, working people get out of it? Well, you get higher gas prices, you get um, complete abandonment of any sort of social issue or economic issue that you want, like healthcare, like, uh, you know, college debt forgiveness. Um, and that's it. That's all you get. So I think it, it's best people start paying attention as to really, you know, your own turf. Like, who cares? Here's about Putin and what you think about Putin. Like, look at what Biden and this administration are doing. And look at how even it's not enough for some neocons, what he's doing. Like, they want him to go on into full out war. And I think Biden's going to be the fall guy in terms of, of the the GOP blaming him for the upcoming election um, that's going to be happening because uh, he's disappointing some people. He's not being enough of a warmonger. Uh, because they want full out war. They want to fully attack Russia. And uh, with the Hunter Biden laptop story and the admission that all of it was true by the New York Times, you have to think about why they're admitting to that now. And the reason they're admitting to it now, of course, is because now uh, they have no choice. But also now they can say, OK, well, we're going to let Biden take a bit of this hit and continue going further. So we'll see. Yeah, that's a good point. I hadn't really thought of that. I just assume that they don't care and they're just going to let the Republicans win because they like that anyway. Um, so, okay, so I we've run out of time because you told me that you had until two o'clock. Um, uh, thank you so much for coming on. Um, and I hope that, um, I hope it, well, I hope to talk to you again sometime. <laughs> for sure, for sure, definitely. Um, and you guys can find me on Twitter, Fiorella Isabel M on Twitter. And also, obviously, I'm on the Combo Couch YouTube and Rockfin. Support Rockfin because YouTube is censoring the hell out of everybody. So um, okay. thank you so much. Yeah, so everyone follow Fiorella on Rockfin if you follow her on YouTube already. Thank you. Bye. Bye. All right. Um, that's it for Fiorella. I am really have been like trying to get her on for a while, but she's always busy. Um, so that was awesome. Um, so um, thanks so much for coming on. Um, I just want to remind you guys um, to get the word out there about the student debt strike on May 1st. Um, you can find out about it at the Debt, the debt Collective, um, and hopefully they won't cancel it this time. Um, so that's what's going on there. Um, let me see. And I couldn't, I tried to get to your question, Laura Pilgrim, about um, France, about um, whether it'll affect uh, Macron's chances of getting elected to have gas prices going up in Europe and um, all of these trucker protests in Italy and Germany. Um, but she went way, she like re does a lot of research um, um, and she kind of went way deeper than I expected her to. <laughs> um, so we just, I just didn't have time. So, um, yeah, um, anyway, um, so that's it for today. Um, we have a stream tonight um, for INN. Um, I think it's going to be like at 8 or 9 o'clock. I'm going to stream it to this channel. And um, INN is not really like a network. It's like a network of disparate people on Twitter. Um, it's not, um, and um, but there's going to be a lot of great people there. Um, Tara Reid. Um, is going to be there, um, uh, be the change. To t uh, I don't think Tatami is going to be there. Um, um, <clears throat> but anyway, um, a lot of people, um, Angel Rivera, I brought him on um,
previously onto the show. And just like a ton of other people, I don't have a list in front of me right now. Um, but that'll be tonight. So I will see you guys then, um, probably. And that's it for today. Hopefully, um, the spike in food prices, even though food prices have been going up here, but not as quickly as gas. So um, I don't think it's going to affect us that much as much as Europe, um, because we're we're like we're more closely tied to the agricultural countries and like agricultural economy of Latin America, um, not of Europe, you know. Um, but you know, um, it's yet to be seen what actually happens, especially since Venezuela actually um, like the U.S. went running for help to Venezuela, and Venezuela was like, "Fuck you guys." You fucked, up, fucked us this long. Um, we don't want to help you right now. And that's what's happening. Venezuela is actually supporting Russia. So it's yet to be seen whether U.S. Um, fully lifts sanctions on Venezuela. Um, because if they do, I'm pretty sure like the Venezuelan government is trying to negotiate right now in order to get a better deal out of the U.S. Um, because they know that these are like fair weather allies. Um, and tomorrow, you know, it'll it, like <laughs> um, they'll try to like screw Venezuela again, which, by the way, is why I forgot to bring this up. This is part of why the United States thinks oil exploration in Colombia is so important. They want to find new sources of um, energy in Colombia. Colombia is very close to Venezuela. It doesn't have as much oil, but it does have some. Um, and do Colombia does have resources and they want to tap into the those resources. And the fact that there is like and even slightly progressive, even though I'm not like a big fan of that word, progressive, there's a progressive candidate. Um, but um, over there, that means a little bit more. It doesn't mean that they're going to go like full left, but it does mean that they're probably going to put up some kind of resistance to capital. And the fact that Colombia might say no to oil exploration at the same time that Venezuela is telling them to go fuck themselves and they really, really need those um, that cheap gas. Um, that's going to really affect the U.S. And that's why we really have to keep an eye on Colombia and Venezuela right now, um, because what they do is actually going to be pivotal for the U.S. And if they don't take the side of the U.S., then we really are fucked. Like, we can't just keep sanctioning Russia as our southern neighbors also turn against us. Um, so, you know, a turn against the government. I don't think they're turning against us, the American people. Um, but that's definitely going to have some kind of influence. So um, anyway, <laughs> um, thanks so much um, for, uh, for joining, and I will see you guys on the next round.